Hey, welcome to the closing beat, everybody. Happy, happy Wednesday. How you doing today, huh? Everybody doing all right? Did you make it through the day? <laughs> this is our quick stock market update show where we cover the stock market, the good, the bad, and again, the ugly that we'll be focusing on today. And uh, we're financial advisors here at Jazz Well, so I'm just trying to teach you something. Uh, you know, it's marketing, right? If you see the name on the shirt, you see the logo there. Just trying to keep you in mind if you have IRAs, old retirement accounts, or you're just saving for a long-term sort of investment strategy there, uh, and you want some help from someone that's just not gonna charge you every time we talk or has no expense ratios on our funds, which are all listed on our website and updated, by the way. Well, I hope you'll keep us in mind there. And in the meantime, I'll just keep giving, try to teach you guys something new as we go here and uh, just, you know, doing my thing. So we'll keep it going today. Uh, we're also playing a game it's called Guess the Dow. On Fridays, we announce the winners. Person who can guess the Dow closest without going over will send you a $100 gift card. Or if you're one of our clients, we will credit your account if you prefer that. Or you, you could also take the gift card as well. Well, uh, let's get started. So we've got the Dow lower by 494, S&P 52 and 123 on the NASDAQ. The market's actually sold off all morning long, found a little support around lunchtime as everybody went and had a hot dog or something and quit trading for a while. So a little bit of support there, but nothing really meaningful. The market's basically finished uh, near their lows. If you're looking at the Dow, this is sort of the number that I imagine will be plastered all over financial media. Um, if you look at the Dow so far this week, from high to low, that's over 1,100 points. That's a big number, so they tend to focus on those because it gets your attention. Uh, so it's only been two days, uh, or it's only been a couple days this week, and from high to low, uh, that is going to be 1,100 points. Uh, now, if you're looking at the S&P 500 today, you go, well, all right, yeah, about a 2% decline. Is that really that big of a deal? Well, it was pretty brutal, actually. There was a lot of selling uh, in a broad way. A lot of people just saying, all right, let me take some money off the table. I would imagine some short-term traders as well having a little bit of profit there. You had 46.5%, almost 50% of the S&P 500 was down by 2% or more. I was talking to uh, my accountant today, and he's like, I'll make this brief because I'm sure you're busy today. And I'm like, you know what? This is like the first rally, uh, the first pullback in the market that I think everybody wanted, right? I think we're all happy with it, whether you're trying to buy because you've been waiting to buy, whether you're looking to add more for, you know, you just like buying dips or whatever, whether you're an active trader and you've been shorting the market, just wondering like, oh, this thing has to fall. Uh, it seems like everybody was pretty much cool and is currently cool with the markets falling. And it was funny because he said, you know, that's funny. I was thinking about investing a little bit of money, but I just couldn't get myself to do it with the market at highs. And he's like, you know, now you think about it, like, yeah, now I'm kind of excited. And I'm like, yeah, that's my biggest question I've been getting from customers today is now, now, <laughs> should I buy now? Uh, so it doesn't have the same feel as other declines. Now that could rapidly change, right? The markets keep selling off here. So, uh, you know, as of now, just a couple percent decline. Most people don't seem to care. Uh, it is October. October is a very, uh, Volatile month is historically the most volatile month. Uh, we covered this yesterday. I'll touch on it briefly here. If you look at the lifespan of the S&P 500, most months from high to low, if you were to take the high and the low of each month and just go back all the way back to 1928, um, most months in the S&P 500 average six and a half percent uh, as a range, meaning it wiggles back and forth. At some point it's up here, at some point it's down here. The range is typically about six and a half percent. You can back out a few months. February and December tend to be a little bit lower, about five percent. Um, I'm not sure why in February, maybe because there's one less day or a couple less days. Uh, December I can understand because of the holidays, a little less volatile there. But October, if you look at historically all the Octobers, you're at eight and a quarter percent from high to low. So we know it's the most volatile month and it's something to be expected in there. And really the volatility here this month is stemmed all from manufacturing numbers. So I'll pull up the chart. Is this gonna work? <laughs> I was, it's like you never know until the last second. So uh, manufacturing numbers, the, uh, the gold line there, that's manufacturing. We talked about this yesterday. So a, a downtick here back, uh, holding steady below 50. A lot of people use that as sort of the correction area for manufacturing, however, Manufacturing is not a large part of our overall economy. Uh, services are the big chunk of how uh, our economy grows. And uh, the services number last time, remember, we had manufacturing come out, it ticked lower, everybody panicked. Then services came out two days later, ticks higher, and everybody goes, oh, okay, whew, it's fine. This time, manufacturing ticks a little bit lower. Tomorrow, we have services numbers coming out, or they're called non-manufacturing. So it's basically the same report, X manufacturing uh, they, they go and just look at only the services sector there. Um, so it, for the first time in a while, 
there's going to be a lot of eyeballs looking straight at one report tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, we'll be sure to talk about it. Here's the divergence currently between our economic uh, growth there. So I just put them both on a chart there just to kind of help you out and uh, see if you like uh, see if you like that. All right, here we go. Let's jump over to the stock market here. So uh, you've got a nice little pullback in the S&P 500 headed back for the 200 day moving average. There is uh, kind of, I don't know that this is perfect. Technical traders probably won't focus too heavily on this, but you have a little bit of an uptrend, right? So there'll be some algorithms and the automated trading systems that'll draw that trend line in there. I get it. I don't like it as just for me, just, I don't think it's as clean as it could be. Uh, so I think anywhere between uh, down here around 2861 and the 200 day moving average is probably more than fair. If we pierce through a little bit, I don't think it's a big deal. I'll tell you what, if the market's open lower tomorrow, would you not feel like buying that if you're a short term trader? Two days down aggressively, very extended, you have a gap lower. That would be traditionally a day trader's buy in that case. You'd be looking for stocks that do the same thing or just play the market directly. Want to bring one thing to your attention. Uh, this is kind of unique. I like pointing these sort of things out if I can. I got to change to a two year chart. Let's go back to October of last year. We'll zoom out. Uh, there's October. Check this out. So if we take and draw a line, I've been pointing this out every now and then, we've got to go, come on, things in the way. So we've got to go to October 1st, we'll take the opening price of October 1st, so just draw a straight line over to the closing price of October 1st, which was here yesterday. There you go. Put it there nice and straight. Is it not the same number? <laughs> it's the same number. The market's been doing this here, and what does that mean? It's just not, I'm not just, you know, having fun drawing on charts. What that means is if you invested in October 1st of last year, you were at the same exact point. You just went negative on your account for the first time. It tells you that, look at how many times we intersect this line along the way. And I'm going to back away so you can see it there. But look at how many times we intersect that line, meaning you had to go through a whole lot of stress, a whole lot of excitement, then a little more stress, then a little more excitement, then some more stress again, then a little excitement, now back to stress. Right? So the markets, or well, the Dow, has been really accomplishing nothing in the last year. And that's just a great way to show it. Um, I did this for the S&P on August 14th. August 14th of this year in the S&P and August 14th of last year in the S&P, same thing. I mean, it's the same number, right? Within a fraction of a point of being the same number. So uh, that's the Dow there. That's going to get some attention probably. I don't, I don't just something I keep track. I don't know why I keep track of this stuff, Dustin. Right? Do something else. Get a hobby, right? <laughs> Anyways, uh, that's the Dow. So you've got all the markets basically just pulling back on the day. It's not, it, it's not pretty. I mean, any way you look at it. And it's not one of those days where you could say, yeah, but it was because of something and only one area sold off. No, it was pretty much across the board. So uh, get used to that one here in the short term. Uh, Fed recession uh, projections. Uh, we talked about this yesterday. Uh, we'll show it one more time. Uh, we'll just go in here. I don't have it loaded up for you. Re oops. Recession. And I'll back out the manufacturing numbers. If you look at the recession expectations, nope, wrong one. There it is. Okay, recession expectations, 37.93% for there to be a recession next year in June uh, 2020. You basically, this is how you look at this line. You see 2020 here? So if you were to say, what about, what's the probability of their recession in January of next year? It's basically 21%. You go on over here and just, oh, what about February or March, 27% uh, and so on and so on. So basically expectations of a mid-year start to the recession next year, according to the Fed, uh, is about 37%. And I like to point out the historical numbers here because this is a historically high number. 37 itself relative to 100 doesn't seem like much, but relative to history. And if we put the recessions in there, you can see how every time there's a recession, we've been at this number in here or higher. So uh, a lot of people focusing on that one. I thought I'd just point that out for you. Uh, not to scare you. <laughs> I just thought, <laughs> what are you doing? Just thought I'd share it with you there. So uh, that's what you got there. Now, uh, sector-wise, almost every sector in the markets lost 1% or more on the day. Uh, crude oil is a big focus today. We'll go over and look at the uh, futures directly. Lost about 2% on the day. Had higher inventory numbers. We were expecting 1.6 million barrels uh, in increase of our overall supply. I think we got 3.1. Don't hold me to that, but I think it was 3.1 million barrels. That number comes out on Wednesday, so the inventory number is a little bit higher than expected. Oil continuing to pull back. We can get rid of this. This is what's known as a busted pattern. Uh, so anything related to oil uh, also fell lower, right? You had XOP, this would be your oil and gas explorers, a little bit lower, the energy uh, category moving towards lows there. Um, oil service stocks also 
darn near about to hit new 52 week lows. Um, so no matter what you follow in the oil and energy space, a little bit we uh, weak on the day. Uh, I don't really have a lot. I mean, it doesn't make sense to go through a lot of the different sectors here. They were all down. I mean, just rough day. Utilities didn't have as bad of a day. REITs didn't have as bad of a day. Continuing their strength there. Here is uh, industrials trying to break through the 200-day uh, moving average, um, and that's basically a flat 200-day moving average. That's almost as flat as you can get it. So supposed to act as good support there, industrials, although extended in the short term, just a little bit down on the day. Let's cover some individual stocks for you, shall we? TD Ameritrade, officially getting rid of commissions, mostly. Oh, I'm pretty much getting rid of commissions, right? Stocks in the U.S., ETFs in the U.S., uh, Canadian stocks and ETFs. I know a lot of you do that, so that's good. Um, option contracts, I believe, still have about a 65 cent uh, commission on them. That's fair. I tell you what, what do you think about this commission thing going on here? How do you how do you feel about that? Uh, TD Ameritrade, it, this is going to cost them about 230 million dollars a quarter hit to their bottom line. About 15 percent of their business comes from commissions. I'm all for it. Let's pay commissions, right? I think that if you or an active trader, you, obviously you're driving volume, you deserve a little bit of a discount. If you want to be a rebate trader, you deserve a little bit of a discount. If they get to keep the rebate, okay, you deserve a little bit of a discount. But these platforms that these guys offer, particular TD Ameritrade, uh, somewhat E-Trade, they're okay. Uh, TradeStation, things like that. These are incredible platforms for the active or really detailed trader. Uh, and you just, they're not going to be able to build these tools. Uh, so, you know, the fact that they're not going to get this income if they don't make it up somewhere, it's like, okay, that platform is basically as good as it's going to get. And I get it. They're trying to con uh, compete against Robinhood, but uh, you guys are going to hate me for this. Robinhood's platform is junk compared to some of these active platforms. Robinhood is really designed for the person that's like, hey, I saw on TV this pot stock was higher. Let me buy this pot stock. Very poor in terms of the... The, the features that they offer in there. So anybody that takes trading just a little bit more serious than sort of randomly picking a stock, you know, they don't use Robinhood, I'm sorry, sorry to say. Not only that, Robinhood's not a profitable company. They're just not, period. You could tell because they would have gone public by now. They can't. They can't go public. They're just, it's not going to happen. So the changes they've made there, I just, it, to me, it's like, I'm all for paying a little bit. I, I don't know where you stand on that, but I'll pay a few dollars a trade. And if I happen to trade a little bit more, give me a discount. That's all I ask, right? Look at interactive brokers. You can do the same thing. The more you trade, the less you pay. Okay, that's fair, right? As you start driving more revenue for them, uh, you get all the tools and everything. Their customer service is horrible, by the way, but uh, you get a lot of tools. I've used all of these platforms. And so for me, I'm like... I would rather pay a little bit more and keep demanding improvements to the platform, getting the features and things that really help people in, in the active space. If you're not an active trader, you could care less. You're like, whatever, that's a big deal. We're not active traders here at Jazz Wealth. It's just, I know a lot of you are, and I, I think this is gonna really hurt them in the long run. Schwab the other day, they, uh, yesterday actually, they cut their commissions as well. That's enough on that one. Facebook a little bit lower here today. Uh, apparently Visa and MasterCard, they haven't officially signed on on this new Libra uh, currency that, uh, that they're trying to set up. Um, Visa and MasterCard are just a little bit concerned that their current good standings with the government may change if they go into bed with Facebook over here. And so they're still asking some questions. So the stock was a little bit lower. It actually held up pretty good. It was only down 0.69%. So not really that big of a deal. Um, I'll pull up the charts here so we can play along together. There we go. Uh, we talked about Lennar reporting earnings. Uh, so they did well on earnings. Everything looked good there. 3.75% on the day. Beat on earnings, beat on revenue. Uh, overall new orders for their uh, homes up 9%. That's okay. That was better than expected. So, I mean, it's, it's not great compared to, you know, what they've done, but uh, still good. So Lennar, one of the home builders strong on the day. Uh, you might notice uh, Delta Airlines sold off right in the middle of the day. Just you got a little gap lower and then aggressive little sell off there. Four and a half percent down. Uh, they lowered their guidance for the third quarter. They've got earnings coming up here October 10th, October 10th, I believe. Don't, eh, I don't know. October 10th, I believe. And um, they also uh, raised their uh, cost expectations. So that's a metric that they follow there. They say, well, our costs are going to be a little bit higher. Stock gets hit ahead of earnings. Uh, Ford a little bit lower, three and a quarter percent on the day. Uh, total vehicle sales. They used to up these, update these every month, by the way, right? So Ford comes out and they'll give you their vehicle sales numbers. Up until last year, early last year, just every month, they'd be like, total, here's total vehicle sales broken down by trucks and all that great stuff. And that's important because uh, looking at their trucks, 
uh, we always look at the, uh, if you're an investor or anybody who's into this stuff, you always look at their um, F-Series trucks, right? And you go, well, okay, who cares? Well, they're more profitable for them uh, than the cars are. But also, uh, isn't it kind of a measure of the overall economy? Right, small businesses out there using these trucks to move tile and stuff to do everything that they got to do. Uh, well, trucks, uh, yeah, that's not good. <laughs> so that'll give you an idea where we stand here. So uh, the F Series trucks uh, were down six percent. Now, still strong. It's very strong. It's just down six percent relative to last quarter. Overall vehicle sales were down four and four point nine percent in general. But uh, those truck sales being down six percent. Remember, when I give you a number, you go. Okay, quit throwing numbers at me, right? Like, what does it mean? Is this good? Is this bad? The last time their truck sales dipped by 6% quarter over quarter uh, was during the financial crisis, 2008, right? Other than that, their truck sales don't dip like that much. 6% is a, is a big one there. So uh, something maybe I don't mean to scare you guys a little bit more, but it's one of those extra things that lets you go, well, I'm not gonna use the yield curve as my recession indicator, but I'll keep it in mind. I'm not gonna use manufacturing as my uh, indicator, but I'll keep it in mind. I'm not gonna use the Fed's recession indicators as, a, as my single indicator, but I'll keep it in mind. I'm not gonna use Ford. I'm not gonna use FedEx, right? I'm not gonna use Caterpillar. Uh, but now you start piling all these things onto it and you go, we really are slowing down, aren't we? Not crashing, but slowing down. Anyways, uh, you got, uh, what do we got here? Uh, three new highs on the day. Uh, that's it. <laughs> so uh, both of them, or two of them, were in the home builder space. Lennar, you already saw, made new highs there. Uh, that was one of them. Pulte Homes was the other one that poked up to new highs. Didn't finish quite as strong, but not a big deal there. And then you had a REIT. Uh, HCP, we happen to own this one in our REIT fund. It hit new highs as well. These things are okay to take a break, in my opinion. If REITs pulled back, took a little bit of a break, or went sideways for a while, I don't think anybody would care. We'd all be happy. You had 15 new lows. Five of those were oil names. Understandable. We talked about oil earlier in the day. See how we did there? Put the puzzle together for you. <laughs> so uh, oil lower on the day. Oil stocks lower on the day. Diamond Offshore, just one of them that's been weak. Uh, Marathon Oil also uh, hitting new lows. It's been bouncing around there for a while, as you can see. Now it's about to fall off the end of the chart. As you can imagine, uh, E-Trade. Uh, lower on the day, are they going to cut commissions next? Kind of puts them in a bind. TD Ameritrade responded quickly. Interactive Brokers uh, started this whole thing. Schwab, of course, we know what they did, so we'll see. Uh, Carnival Cruise Line hitting new 52-week lows. I'll continue to say, you don't like that. That was a nice little bounce off the bottom there. The fact that it gave it up so quick, uh, you don't really like to see that. I get it. They're spending a lot of money. They're trying to expand and everything, but hmm. CBS lower on the day. That was a big loser, about down 4% on the day. There's a lot going on in this space. So you see uh, Fox as well with the Disney acquisition and everything, or reverse, you know what I'm saying. Um, so a lot of news going on in that space. I've chosen not to follow it. Uh, I think that this space is overcrowded in terms of, well, not overcrowded, but I think there's too many offerings. I think it needs to be some consolidation. So I'll focus on the telecom sort of traditional media space uh, when there's some co consolidation. When Netflix buys somebody or somehow... Apple gobbles up somebody, all right, then we can start talking. But for now, for the consumer, what are you supposed to do? I'll just keep my cable at this point. Am I going to spend, I don't know, maybe $120 a month on, on cable? Or am I going to go spend $50 on YouTube and $20 on Hulu? And, you know, I get that Apple's going to be cheap and everything. But am I going to go spend all this money on all this stuff and just have it add up to the same amount anyways? I just keep TV. Do you watch a lot of TV? Do you? Anyways, let's move on. Uh, AMD, that was our stats play. This is the second day here. It's supposed to be up 2.09% in the next five days. With this market here, I don't think it's going to happen, guys. <laughs> so I drew a line there. This was one we talked about. I'm sort of skeptical of this one anyways, but stats are stats. We'll follow them. Um, any snapback in the markets you know, would certainly help. And by the way, semiconductors as a whole haven't been hit as hard as some of the other areas there. So, um, so I guess there's a chance. Uh, Tesla. So... Uh, it's down a little bit here on the day. I'll take a look and see. Does it happen to be down after hours? Anybody? I'll find it here. I know there's a delay in the uh, thing here. They, they put out 97,000 cars. Oh, boy. Yeah, it's down uh, about 4% after hours here. Tesla comes out with their uh, car, uh, car report there. They put out 97,000 cars. We were expecting 99,000, and Mr. Musk had hinted at the possibility of 100,000. He put out an email and said, we got a real shot to do this and everything. Uh, so they missed expectations. It's not that bad, though, if you think about it. Um, last quarter, they did 95,200 uh, 95, cars. So we did 97,000. Slight improvement there. Just wasn't as good as Wall Street was expecting. So it's taken a little bit of a hit there. 
Uh, paychecks, good relative strength in paychecks, by the way. Uh, I did it. You see what I did? I did it again. <laughs> okay, paychecks. Good relative strength there. They come out with earnings better than expected and everything. Uh, good profit margin there as well. Uh, almost up about 2% on a day where the markets were pretty weak. Um, so that's that one. And what else do we have? I will get ready to take your questions. I'm going to just cover a few more things. You've got a billion Fed members out there speaking. Tomorrow you have one, two, three, four, five Fed members speaking. They are out in droves. See how they do it? I've been bringing this up the last few days ago. Hmm, you see all these Fed members talking? Isn't that interesting? Uh, John Williams was out today. Uh, he's a voting member, by the way, so he gets a little more attention in the news. Uh, John Williams was out today, and he basically said that uh, the Fed, uh, their policy is good right now. We're good with it. There should be no change. Uh, and so he was basically saying, we're good as it is. His actual quote was, the Fed's policy is currently in the right place. Mighty eloquent there. Uh, there's now a 75.4% chance uh, that traders are expecting a rate cut here later in October. Uh, 25 basis point rate cut. Uh, it was 53% last week. So you got a sharp uptick there naturally because <laughs> the market fell. <laughs> there's a lot of questions now about all this stuff. Uh, so that's that. Bernie Sanders uh, apparently uh, having some stents put in, canceling uh, all of their sort of rallies and stuff. That's sad to see. I mean, you love him or hate him. You, you don't want to see somebody in bad shape like that. So we'll, uh, not a whole lot of other news on him. That was, that was basically it. Um, what else do we have? Tomorrow we got earnings from Constellation Brands. They make alcohol. Uh, Pepsi coming out, expecting $1.51. Costco coming out, expecting $2.56 a share. Uh, we'll see how that goes. You got Western Digital paying out 50 cents, uh, NTAP, Network Appliances paying out 48 cents, and Rangold paying out 27 cents. Cisco as well, Cisco the food company paying out 39 cents. I mentioned that because we happen to own that one. Uh, nice. What else do I have for you? Twitter, their website's back up and running because something happened there. They weren't uh, too particular on uh, what happened, but nonetheless, it's back up and running if you care. All right, let's see if you have any questions. I'm happy to answer them, and we'll... Wrap it up. Put this day behind us. Um, sling is cheaper than, than cable. Yeah, I mean, but it's like there's so many different services. I mean, it's crazy. Dustin, you excited for, am I excited for Tesla? I don't really like Tesla, to be honest. I, I just, that's a tough one. I don't like that volatility. You, so one of the things we have to do in our funds is we have to make sure that your moving at the speed you need to move at. So you'll notice all of our funds are on our website and they all have different volatility rankings. And I put them out there for people that care about volatility. But our goal is now to get as much of that growth as our objective says we're gonna do with the least amount of volatility. So if you had to choose between two stocks, let's just say, take all the quality out of it, just, just the price movement. If you were measuring, say, Apple versus Tesla, and both companies fundamentally were the same company, which would you choose? You could only invest in one to get the best growth. Now, assume that both of those were gonna grow at the same pace, even, right? There was no chance of you getting this trade wrong. You were going to see them grow at the same pace. Would you rather have Apple or would you rather have Tesla? Well, Tesla is a lot more volatile, at least it has been, uh, versus Apple, actually. The comparison is pretty dramatic. So when it comes to these, uh, us adding uh, positions to our funds and stuff, we, we gotta keep that in mind, right? I want you to see the least amount of fluctuation day to day for the most amount of growth. And there's nobody else that does that. I'm, I mean, I'm, I don't mean to like toot my own horn or whatever, but there's nobody else that does that unless it's like a very well-run mutual fund. There's a couple, um, I happen to know the guy at a, a blue chip fund, and um, he does that, and his team does that. But uh, amazing. Other than that, you basically, you just get people that say, okay, you're expecting to be invested in the S&P 500, bam, take it. For better, for worse, this is what you get. So for me, Tesla's always been one that, you know, it, it's hard to add to, to a portfolio. Prediction for a 10% drop? Yeah, it's not my prediction. I, I hope it happens. That's my personal preference, but it's not a prediction. Uh, we haven't had a 10% drop this year, and historically we will. So a uh, matter of when. I just was hoping it would happen towards the end of the summer. I guess we're still kind of in that area there. We'll see. We'll see. Um, once gave you the stats on how often markets bounce after a certain percentage sell-off. Yeah, actually, uh, that class is in the dojo as well. Um, how often stocks bounce at different areas. I believe that's where it's at. Um, that'd be a good one to go, uh, go over again. Right? I, I got that one. I like it. Um, 
how Disney, pa yeah, I think it's going to be something like that. Uh, so talking about Disney uh, packaging up Hulu and having their uh, Disney Plus as well. I think it's going to be something like that. Because you see Comcast doing the same thing where they're essentially the Roku online now. Um, that kind of thing, right? You got to be able to package these things where I pay for one service and I end up with at least some of it for free. I, I just, I, I don't know. Especially if the market gets weak, what's the first thing all you guys are going to do if the markets get a little bit weak besides like cry and all that stuff, <laughs> right? You're going to go and go, hey, wait a minute. I have all these subscriptions to all these different streaming services. I'm not even watching one of them. They all have basically the same thing anyways for now. So, yeah, it's a tough one. Yep. <laughs> uh, so what's the, what's the question? What's the number for the 10% drop? You mean like on the S&P 500? Uh, I could probably do that for you real quick. For 10% on the S&P 500, uh, you... Ba so here, let's just show you because we'll, well, <laughs> I'll jinx the market again. You ready? I'm going to do this. Last time I did this, the market wouldn't come and help us out. So a 10% drop in the market. I'm going to use the S&P futures here just to keep it simple for me. You know where a 10% drop is? Right here at this prior low. Still the same number. So this line right there is 10%. I'll even change it so we have it there. So we've got a ways to go. You could see, you know, we'll call it red, make it a little thicker. There's your 10%. Yep. New jazz fan. He says, uh, I put my orders at 8% below the highs. We didn't get to 10% last time. Hey, that's fine. Even if you don't pick the bottom. I was talking to customers today and they're like, all right, I'll just, I want to buy when this thing falls. I don't need to get the bottom. Just get me something better, right? And uh, even if you don't pick the bottom, you know, it's still to get a discount. In the long run, you can't argue with that. And people go, you can't time the market and everything. Yeah, I believe it, right? I've, we've done all the studies. But if you're adding money week after week after week to whatever your account is, and you can up that amount when the markets fall, you feel good about it. Come on. Um, well, so uh, the question is on Ulta. Oops. How Ulta pulled back. The Come on. There we go. So Ulta pulling back. Now, uh, in the short term, think about it. It's the same whether the stock is in an uptrend or a downtrend. In the short term, there's been a lot of excitement. People that wanted to buy this stock and bet on this bottom here, they did. It's over. They already took their, their bets. What puts it higher from here? Probably nothing. There's not much that's going to make this stock just continue rallying higher. I, I'm not saying that I know something. I'm just saying all the energy is already built into the stock. Now it's time for this thing to just relax and go back and forth for a while, be uneventful, fade away from the headlines and not be a big deal. And I'll bet you that's what happens. Yeah. Even the app for TD Ameritrade is called Think or Swim. Yeah, that's, I'm, that's what I'm using. That's the charts that I use to show you here is the Think or Swim. It's not the app, of course, but, you know. Yeah. Um, so I can't really, like, how do you feel about Wendy's? What do you, what do you mean? Like, you guys, you got to be a little more specific for me. If you owned the stock, you'd be a little bit worried, right? You wouldn't want to have a full position of Wendy's. If you were looking to buy it, 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 to me, there's no real hurry to buy the stock. But it depends on what your goal is, so it's, it's tough for me to answer. If you're a short-term trader, it's a whole different scenario, right? Because if you're just going for a little bit or whatever. So I'm still getting a vibe for some of your names to see who's the active traders, who's the investors out there. I'll learn them after a while. I've got a good memory. <laughs> oh, you wanted to buy? Well, it's a shame. You had the chance to play a little volatility. Yeah, that's all right. Good spike in volatility. It happens. That's a tough product. That's a very tough product. Yep. Uh, is Disney putting in a bottom? Yeah, in the short term, uh, without giving my opinion, you would expect that Disney is oversold at this point, and with the market's help, even just for a few days, that that would be a good support area. People would buy Disney, and it would bounce. I can't naturally say that I think it will bounce. I, I, I don't know. I, I can't say that it'll bounce, but um, would you think that it would bounce from here? Absolutely. Yeah. I don't have the stats on it. Otherwise, I would have just said, well, there's a certain percent of the time that that would happen. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, dividend question. You're heavy in monthly paying REITs. You're 40 years old and you only bring in 
monthly. Do you have a monthly REIT that is a favorite? The reason you bring in $48 a month is just purely because you don't have enough money, right? And I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying that if you're focused on REITs at the moment, they will not outperform. You, from REITs, you get your dividends and you've got your growth. In the long run, the growth will be much less than just simply having a growth stock portfolio or something. So until your account balance is larger, I would not focus so heavily on the REITs, right? When you have a bigger balance, then you're willing to sacrifice some of the growth in exchange for the dollars that it'll pay. That's a big one. So many people get trapped into that. Five, 10 years go down the road, all of a sudden REITs haven't grown at all. The same $48 is coming in and you saw no growth in your, in your overall holdings there, right? So now you go, well, crap. Now it's 10 years later, I can't be aggressive now. I can't do this growth fund anymore. Now I'm stuck making just a little bit in these dividend funds if they're even paying that much by then. Uh, sorry, the REITs by then. So that's a tough one. I, I come across that one a lot. Yep. You've been buying the oil stocks, BP, yeah, Royal Dutch, because uh, they are near five-year lows. You bottom picker, huh? <laughs> so um, I would say look into those names and just make sure that the cash is there for them to pay the dividends. You can, um, there's all kinds of tools where you can see the historical stats on how they uh, have adjusted, whether they've cut back dividends and whether they paused it or anything along the way. I would look into that and just make sure you're safe to collect those dividends and they're likely going to continue to pay them while you're trying to pick the bottom. I have no problem with people that like trying to pick the bottom on stocks if you're just you know, going for it like that. Um, usually what I suggest though is that you mix in some kind of an ETF, right? So you can have preference on some of the names. Go look at some of the oil and energy ETFs that maybe pay a little dividend as well and see if you can mix that in there just so you have a little cushion. Think of it as like a parachute, right? So if one of your, if the, if oil bounces and one of those names doesn't bounce, well, at least you're getting some of that support off the low and you're getting some of your, you know, your effort and your time trying to pick these bottoms, you're going to still profit from that a little bit. So I would mix in a little bit of an ETF, one or two, if you, if you have the capital. Yeah. You missed the whole show. Ugh, come on. <laughs> uh, so Altria is still fighting off the, the vaping sort of issues there. Um, I like Altria on any sort of extended drop. It doesn't normally do that, but on any sort of extended drop, I just, you know, to me, whether you agree or disagree with their business model, that's a discount. If you like discounts and you're willing to put that uh, off to the side, that's a discount. Daryl says, should you roll over your TSP after military retirement? That's okay. That's a tough one, right? So this depends on the individual. If you are okay with the funds that they have and you're okay with what they're doing with all your money sending it to China, most people don't notice or don't care. But if you're okay with that, the, the different fund offerings you have, stay there, right? There's no better account on the planet. If you go, look, I don't like these funds. I want to do my own thing. I want to have some positions in there. I want to get some help or have someone do this for me. All right, then you can move it. Just know it's cheaper where you're at, right? That's a good that's a good one. I've, I've done a video on that to say what's the best retirement account, what's the worst retirement account. Um, and so you you got to look at you for that. There's no good general answer. If I had to give a general answer, I would say leave it there if you're happy with what's going on. Yep. Do you do any options trades? I'm happy to talk about them. Uh, I can talk about them. I love talking about them. Um, I don't do any or mention any here just because I can just see that opening up a can of worms and all of a sudden I go this way when I'm supposed to stay on topic and be focused and everything. So I usually don't mention them. If you have a trade and you're wondering what you should do with it, of course I could talk about it, at least give you the choices and stuff. Um, I have a lot of customers that ask questions about that and I, I do love sort of digging into that, but not really. Stitch Fix dropped because they, uh, they didn't over, over well, right? They, they sort of over-promised and under-delivered. Yeah, earnings weren't that bad. 10% uh, to me, I, I think is maybe a little bit much for how much it fell, but um, they raised their guidance. They were so optimistic last quarter about what this quarter would be like. And even though this quarter wasn't horrible, uh, they just didn't blow the top off of it, right? So everybody was like, what happened, right? You were doing so well and then you said everything was gonna be good and then you showed up with nothing really exciting. And that's probably what happened with Stitch Fix there. Stitch Fix. Okay, I think I've covered it all. I'll wrap it up here. I appreciate you guys watching and following along and everything. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Keep us in mind here at Jazz Wealth. Worst case, hit the subscribe button. I like it, right? I'm supposed to tell you to do that. If you'll do that, I appreciate it. I'll come back tomorrow and we'll do this all over again. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, see ya. Hey, wait, before you go watch one of our other great videos, have you had a chance to see our new Fin Tips videos? 
They focus on one topic at a time, covering investing, personal finance, and anything that can quickly help you with your dough. Best of all, we'll keep it real short, because we know time is money. Why should you choose JazzWealth as your retirement or long-term investing service? Our portfolios are managed by us, not some faceless mutual fund manager. Our private classes will teach you everything about investing and getting your dough straight. Best of all, our fiduciary standard means your best interest comes before ours.